Do you realize that today is an uniquely American holiday? It's Super Bowl Sunday. What's more American than football and champions, right? Only one team today is going to say we're number one. Today you're going to see athletes pounding on their chests, pointing to themselves and their accomplishments. Well, the church year schedule of readings, you know, we have a set of readings that go with each Sunday. Well, the church year schedule of readings provided the perfect sermon text for Super Bowl Sunday, 1 Corinthians 1, 26 to 31. It's the perfect text because it shows how much different God's world is than our world. This world we live in, it's all about being number one, right? I'm the best, I'm the fastest, whatever. Um, do you know what the correct answer is, by the way, to who came in second place in the Super Bowl last year? Do you know what the correct answer for that is? Who cares? Right? <laughs> That's the world we live in. I'm number one, right? Best in the music, best at academics, and best at all of those things. That's not how God's world works. When it comes to God's world, no one's number one. No one's the best. In fact, when it comes to God's world, spiritually, we're all losers with sin embedded in our genes. But then God has a way to change that. So that's why we want to look at today's text under this theme of God chose me. But first of all, we're going to look at that theme as a question. God chose me? And then we're going to look at it with an exclamation point. God chose me. Repetitive sinners. The first time I came across that phrase, repetitive sinners, was on a visit I had with somebody last week. Just a random visit on a prospect, and all of a sudden he stopped and he said, Pastor, i got to make a confession to you. And I'm like, uh-oh. He goes, I'm a repetitive sinner. And it took me a while to think of an answer for that. But as I was studying for this sermon text, that was in the back of my mind. Repetitive sinner, that describes me. How many times are there things I want to do or, or sins that I, I pray and I work on in my devotional life to keep away and then they come back in? Do you find that happening to yourself too? We all probably could say with Paul, couldn't we? The good we want to do, we don't always do. And then that evil we don't want to do, we sometimes find ourselves doing. Face it, we're all repetitive sinners. Here's another phrase. Splendid sinners. I came across that phrase in a book I read by J.C. Ryle. J.C. Ryle was an Anglican bishop from the 1800s. And he wrote a book titled Holiness. And in that book, he was pointing out how even God's saints fall short of perfect holiness. Here's what he wrote. The holiest actions of the holiest saint that ever lived are all more or less full of defects and imperfections. They're either wrong in their motive or defective in their performance. And in themselves are nothing more than splendid sins deserving God's wrath in condemnation. We're all splendid sinners. Even our best actions, without the grace of God, fall far short of the glory of God. So think about this. We're all repetitive sinners. We're all splendid sinners. Yet God chose me. God chose you. When you think of how we are spiritually by nature, that phrase, God chose me, that becomes a question, doesn't it? You can say it to yourself, I can say it to myself. God chose me? Do you ever notice how all the heroes of faith in the Bible, they all had major character flaws? Notice that? Noah got drunk. Abraham slept with his servant girl. Moses murdered somebody. Rahab was a prostitute. David was an adulterer. Paul persecuted the church. And Peter denied his Savior. 
Why did all those heroes of faith have major flaws? Because that's all God had to work with. Repetitive sinners and splendid sinners. The only perfect people are in heaven. This earth is full of you and me, sinners who are not perfect. And you know what? I think if you and I were in Bible times and one of you or me, we made the hero of faith category, there'd be a major character flaw attached to you and me. So it's really true. What Paul said of the Corinthian Christians, we can say of ourselves, right? Consider your call. Not many of you were wise from a human point of view. Not many were powerful. Not many were born with a high status. Why don't you take a second and do something that's awkward? Just look around at the people in church next to you. Go ahead. Look around. <laughs> see, see, spouses looking right at each other. I was thinking more broadly, okay? Just look around. How many nuclear physicists do you see? How many people with PhDs do you see? How many billionaires do you see? How many CEOs of Fortune 500 companies. How many of you have the descendant from the Queen of England? The point God's making isn't that those people can't be saved, but that's not what's going to save somebody. All the money in the world can't buy you heaven. And you can have all the wisdom in the world, and you'll never figure out, how do I get rid of this mountain of my sin? And your high standing as a mayor doesn't give you any standing before God on Judgment Day. And neither does having royal roots make you a chosen royal priesthood, a child of God. You have to say with me, don't you? God chose me? But yet that, that statement becomes one we say with an exclamation point. God chose me. Look around at each other again. Someone besides your spouse or child. Who do you see? You see children of God, every one of you. Look around, who do you see? Saints, every one of you. Look around, who do you see? Peoples whose names are written in the book of life. People whom God has declared not guilty. People who can say, no one can bring a charge against me. You see lambs and you see sheep of whom Jesus is the good shepherd. You see people of whom the Holy Spirit is living and dwelling and producing incredible good works as people reach out and call to those they haven't seen, as they stop by their house to do things for them, as they offer freely their gifts for the Lord's service and their prayers go up to God as incense. So how can it be that that same group of people, you and me, who are spiritual nothings before God, can sit here and confidently assert, no, God chose me, therefore I'm a child of God. How can we say that? Because of what Paul said. God chose the foolish things of the world to shame those who are wise. He chose the weak things of the world to shame the things that are strong. He chose the lowly things of the world and the despised things and the things that are not to do away with the things that are, so that no one may boast before God. While those words can describe you and me spiritually by nature, those words also describe what Jesus became for us. Jesus became weak when he was conceived of the Virgin Mary, leaving aside all his powers as God. And as he hung on the cross, he was despised. And therefore, the message of cross is foolishness to people. You mean I'm supposed to believe in this convicted criminal who was crucified and died that he is supposed to save me? But remember what Paul said here. God chose the things that are not to do away with the things that are. Jesus wasn't what people thought he was. He appeared weak just as another human being. But the miracles proved otherwise. He was God's son walking around as a human being. And sure, he looked despised on the cross and looked like it was foolishness what happened on the cross. But on the cross, Jesus was watching the game-winning touchdown and defeated Satan. Sure, Satan won the first half of the game when he led Adam and Eve into sin and brought the whole world into sin. But Jesus won the second half of the game and won the game. 
when he finally, in his death and resurrection, defeated once and for all sin and Satan and death. So that's why Paul said in verse 30, but because of him you're in Christ Jesus, who has become for us our righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. Think about it. Jesus is your righteousness. You want to get to heaven? Of course you do. But God says be perfect, as your Father in heaven is perfect. Jesus is your righteousness. He's your perfectness. You have it, what you need to get into heaven. And do you sometimes, like me, feel guilty? Because even your good works are like what J.C. Ryle said, splendid sins. Well, think of it. Jesus is your sanctification. Every good work Jesus did on earth had perfect motive and perfect execution. And that's what Jesus sees in your good works. And do you get tired once in a while of being a repetitive sinner? Those sins you keep trying to limit and minimize, they keep coming back. Well, Jesus is your redemption. In this context, it's not referring to redemption as forgiving your sin. It's saying Jesus is your redemption as your final redemption. There will come a day when you and I, as repetitive sinners, will step from this life into the next life where we can never, ever be a repetitive sinner again. Think about it. Jesus is your righteousness, your sanctification, and your redemption. Why would God do that for you and me? He said in verse 31, God did this so that, just as it's written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. There's a lot of comfort in that phrase, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord, isn't there? Have there been times when you didn't really feel forgiven or you were tempted to doubt that you're forgiven? Then remember that phrase, boast in the Lord. You didn't win your forgiveness of sins. He did. Boast in him. Doesn't matter whether you believe it or not at the moment or feel forgiven at the moment. You are, because it happened right there. And you know what else? For all of us, we're going to eventually have to enter the fourth quarter of our life. And we're going to have to go past the two-minute warning, where we may be laying in a bed or a hospice bed with tubes coming in of us and outside of us. And Satan's going to be right there, wanting you to doubt that God chose you, wanting you to think that somehow getting to heaven has to be connected to something you did. Then remember these words, boast in the Lord. Jesus caught the game-winning touchdown pass with no time left on the cross. He won, Satan lost, the game's over, it's done. God chose you, exclamation mark. But that exclamation mark statement, God chose you, it's a comfort for us. But isn't there a challenge in there for you and me? The challenge to humility? Everything you and I are and have, it only comes from the hand of the Lord, doesn't it? Your athletic ability, your musical skills, your academic ability, any of that skills, and that's all from the Lord. Everything you have, your home, your car, your money, it's from the Lord. All the people in your life, they're all from the Lord, aren't they? We sang in the hymn, Rock of Ages, nothing in my hand I bring, simply to thy cross I cling. That's true of our spiritual life, but it's also true of our physical lives too. All from him, right? Good reason to be humble. But just because everything we have spiritually, physically is from God, that doesn't mean that we're nothings as we walk around life. God doesn't want you walking around with this pity oh me, I'm just a little nothing attitude. No. God chose you. That means you're his child. I look around at this congregation and I see incredible things God has done with each of you. I see parents that have made them family, a Christian family, and raising Christians that way. I see people here sitting who have brought other people to Christ, and now they're in Christ. 
I see a church full of leaders that are dedicated to giving their time serving their Lord. I see people who behind the scenes are calling up people in the congregation and giving them comfort and stopping by. No, we're not nothings. We're not just little old me. God chose you. God chose me. So, today is Super Bowl Sunday. The day when everyone thinks about the champion, right? Remember, God chose you and God chose me. That makes us a champion. Amen.